Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to an episode of Prudent Observations. I am your amphibious host, The Prudentialist, where we'll be covering international relations, geopolitics, and the history of U.S. foreign policy, usually on Saturdays every week. But today, this wonderful Monday evening, I am joined by the well-read and the man who actually introduced me to William Appleman Williams, Mr. George Bagby. How are you, sir? Greetings. I'm doing great. It's very nice to be here. Well, I'm glad that you could come on. So we've got two books, primarily one more so than the other, that we're, we're going to review. And as I sort of alluded, um, Mr. Bagby and I had met IRL at the most recent U.S. Sildings Conference, and he was selling some of his wonderful wares of books and bow ties. And I saw two lovely books called The Tragedy of Mer American Diplomacy, which to me looked like a really nice way to respond to George Kennan, and in a lot of ways it is. And Empire is a Way of Life by a man whose name I had not heard of. And so uh, buying these books and upon reading them, we have a previous episode covering Empire is a Way of Life. But I thought um, Mr. Bagby is also well versed in this gentleman. So I thought we're going to have a great discussion. Um, and we're going to primarily cover uh, the tragedy of American diplomacy. But before we get started, if you could just introduce yourself to the audience and, um, you know, just sort of your general thoughts on Mr. Williams and his work. Indeed. Well, I call myself George Bagby. Um, until recently, I was a high school history teacher. Um, my specialty has been American history. Um, I've, I've uh, collected a lot of literature on the subject, um, tried to keep myself well informed. I, I was always pushing the limits of my knowledge in American history. Um, I don't know who told me about William Appleman Williams. It was certainly someone on the right. Um, those those have been my biggest influences um, in my reading. Certainly, someone told me about him at some point, but it, it is so uh, far away in time. I I cannot recall uh, the circumstance. But at some point, I picked up the tragedy of American diplomacy. And it, it had a major impact on, on my thinking. Now, one of the things about Williams that's really remarkable is if you, if you were to pick up any literature about him today, they would identify him as a man of the far left. But if, if we look at the, at the uh, circumference of political opinion, you, you can at least, uh, you can interpret the, the circle of political opinion in such a way that the, the far left reaches over to the far right uh, on occasion anyway. Um, perhaps we, we encounter that sort of thing these days. We, we can find people who are willing to reconsider lots of preconceived notions over on the other side sometimes. And Williams certainly was that. Um, he was associated with socialist student movements through most of his life, but by the end of his life, he seemed to have a lot in common with George Kennan as far as what he was willing to propose in policy. By the end of his life, he was saying the American empire needs to be dismantled. We need to go back to some radically decentralized sort of order. He ended up being a modern day anti-federalist at the end of his life. And he, he was always a Republican, okay? And we could call him a leftist Republican, but he was identifiably like an anti-federalist stripe of Republican, one that wanted the centers of power as close to home as possible. And I think that that's fascinating. Um, he He's related to like leftist anarchist or anarchist anarchist socialist sorts of things. Um, 
quite the critic of the Soviet Union later in his life as well. So he he's not he's not some some American Soviet file. Um, but he's he's a really interesting guy. Well, one one of the things that uh, I was just reflecting with uh, the Prudentialist about was when when I was rereading the tragedy of American diplomacy for this stream, I realized that I had gotten a lot of my primary source quotes from this volume when I was writing my my progressive era American history lectures. I don't I don't remember where I got a lot of those quotes from, but when I was reading this book, I discovered, oh, that's I'm sure this is where I got that quote from. I wasn't actually quoting Williams. I was quoting people he was quoting. Primary sources, people like John Hay, people like Woodrow Wilson, William Jennings Bryan, uh, Elihu Root, people like that. He he quotes them extensively in this volume. And uh, that's certainly where I got a lot of my perspective on um the turn of the century in American history and just what's going on in foreign policy. You know, it was funny because I, I was reading through both of these books since we scheduled the stream. And I, I think of our mutual friend of sorts, I think of our friend, Christopher Sandbatch, where he had sort of, I, I told him that I was, I've been reading these books and he sort of told me that he, he considers a lot of sort of the paleo conservative movement to sort of emerge out of what traditionally gets called new left uh, academia. You know, um, we, we know that William Appleman Williams is part of this so-called Wisconsin School of Imperialism Studies or uh, of at least understanding American political thought that is called leftist. But I think in a lot of respects, it identifies more so a, a, as the book describes it, a tragedy. And it sort of explains that, you know, in a lot of ways, America is, is Faustian in its nature when it comes to its foreign affairs. But I'm reading through the tragedy of American diplomacy. And I notice these, for lack of a better term, these sort of like K lines, these thoughts of ideas and how I can trace them through other people's thought and their academic work. And I see the similar criticisms that would emerge from Pat Buchanan in you know, death of a superpower or suicide of a superpower or his critiques of neoconservatism and where the right went wrong, highlighting that, you know, these sort of market based, uh, you know, solutions to foreign policy to strengthen our position, like unless we're not going to focus on the nation on home and hearth these things are for nothing and it will waste American treasure and blood and will only accelerate the collapse of the country. Now, Williams writes these two books, Tragedy of American Diplomacy and The Empire's Way of Life in two really interesting periods um, in U.S. history. Uh, the original edition of Tragedy of American Diplomacy comes out in 1959. So we're just out of Korea and we're beginning to see fomentation of discussions of what the United States should do in Indochina. And we're beginning to see the concerns over uh, Fidel Castro and the, the rise of the Cuban Revolution. And the second edition comes out after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is the copy I own. Um, and then, of course, the other one is the tragedy of uh, Empire's a Way of Life, which comes out in 1979, published 1980, which is right after Vietnam. And he's posing more serious questions like the empire that we have is unsustainable. And we need a serious course correction to do that. And it, it echoes to me very similar to that sort of paleo conservative thought on foreign policy. But he does a good job, I think, at least especially for me, because in, in 2023 America, the talk about foreign policy or international relations, there isn't really a strong pedagogical through line from the older schools of thought. You know, the, the realists do have their their children and people like Sumatra Mitra or Elbridge Colby. Um, but this sort of, you know, school of thought with Williams kind of really does only seem to have itself found in paleoconservative circles. But even then, uh, I didn't know who he was until you and I had met and I had bought these books and I can see this relationship. And on top of it, what really struck me as the most interesting is, is that he did a very good job sort of breaking the notion that there was this general quote unquote isolationist retreat in the 1920s and 30s when in fact America was very active in world affairs. And I mean, if you read uh, Empire's A Way of Life and we talked about this on the last couple episodes, you know, every chapter is just fully detailed with citations of every single American intervention in almost every decade of the 20th century. 
So, you know, there was no isolationist retreat from home. It was more so we couldn't abide by Article 10 of the um, what would be the League of Nations. But right. uh, he was this is a great, great author, great works. Um, it It's a reminder for me of things like Pat Buchanan's friendly association with Ralph Nader. Have, have you seen interviews that he conducted with Ralph Nader back in the day? Or is that yeah, one of the I, things I that's disappeared from the internet? <laughs> Everyone seems to forget that he spoke quite fondly of him too when he ran in 2000 as a reform candidate before it was well, shut down, of course, be, in part due to Donald Trump in the 2000 election where he's going to run as a reform candidate. Right. Well, if anyone is unaware of that, you should go and, and check it out because it's a, a wonderful example of a man of the old right with a man of the old left. And I know uh, William Appleman, Appleman Williams, he's he's called a new leftist, but he he has a lot of correspondence with people like Ralph Nader, just as an example. And uh, an, another example that comes to mind is uh, Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul, who found common cause in Congress. Uh, Dennis Kucinich, a congressman from Cleveland, Ohio, um, self-proclaimed socialist and old leftist. So he's really interested in labor issues and such. And Ron Paul, the self-proclaimed libertarian of Texas, member of the House of Representatives, they sponsored bills together. And among among other things, they, they uh, spoke out together coordinating against sending billions of dollars abroad in the form of foreign aid and saying, we, we should keep that money here at home. Of course, Dennis Kucinich has his, his pet socialist programs that he would like to spend it on, but Ron Paul was willing to concede. It would be better to spend it with the socialist program here than to hand it out to the likes of Pakistan and Egypt. So the, those are things that come to mind for me. Um, I, I certainly look at a guy like Ralph Nader and I see obviously a man that one could work with he's at least he's flexible he's willing to talk to people he disagrees with which is more than we can imagine most people doing now at least people in power yes absolutely and it's uh and a more contemporary sort of critique of empire and then we'll we'll get into the book in full uh i recall uh, more recently um the gentleman who goes by Bronze Age Pervert in his critique of empire, he has said that globalism isn't like the mercantilism or even the early 20th century form of American empire. Um, because if you look, and Williams's texts describe this in full, the idea of expanding international markets, uh, predominantly because America was a manufacturing country, it had a manufacturing base unlike any other in the world at the time after World War One, And he talks about this in the first two chapters of the tragedy of American diplomacy that, you know, one of the biggest areas of influence was the National Association of Manufacturers and how do we expand business and how do we sell off our surpluses. Nowadays, America doesn't make anything and America's empire is predominantly built on its you know military prowess and cultural exports and the ability to use economic sanctions, which is something that Williams and Kennan talk about quite a bit. So I, I think that there's these interesting through lines of thought that exist when sort of criticizing the tragic nature of how American diplomacy has evolved. Because, I mean, he writes this book in 59. We're still an industrial powerhouse. We haven't sold off the country yet. But by the time he starts writing Empire's a Way of Life, he's noticing things are well off the wrong track. And it's certainly an interesting just how many people are kind of coming to similar conclusions in a historiography. But um, you you have your notes ready for tragedy of uh, American diplomacy. I, I'm, I do I'm indeed. Much looking, I'm looking forward to hearing them. Well, I'm I wanted to to make one reflection before we move on to that. You and I are both fans of George Kennan. Yes. And George Kennan and William Appleman Williams come to some of the same intriguing conclusions at the end of their lives. I think Williams dies in 1990, and. Uh, Canaan dies 2005. I, I don't I don't recall exactly. I know I know he he makes it uh, past September 11th and and very famously doesn't comment really in uh, in his diaries 
um, which I highly recommend. Uh, Kennan's uh, diaries are an excellent read, um, but it's it's intriguing. He's very much against the invasion of Iraq. He does live long enough to comment on that in his diaries, um, but has apparently nothing to say about September 11th. But Williams and Kennan both both come to conclusions at the end of their lives that there's really no reforming the Constitution and the American government as it is now. And that is, that's a very radical place to end up. And at, le at least the traditional explanation is George Kennan is a man of the right. William Appleman Williams is a man of the left. But they both end up in the same place after a lifetime of studious observation of the empire. Both of them would call it an empire. Kennan does that. Williams does that. Um, they both see it as a net negative for world peace um, and, and even, even the prosperity of our own country. They say that it, it detracts from the prosperity of Americans. And they both end up at the end of their lives saying there's really no way out of this save like a radical political reorganization of the United States itself, the ditching of the Constitution. So they both end up in this very pessimistic, radical place. And that really intrigues me, um, and I'm I'm inclined to take the same position myself. I'm just just kind of writing on their on their pre on their assumptions about these things and and what they had to say about it. Um, but let's let's jump into the tragedy of American diplomacy. Uh, the introduction is a delightful piece, and it introduces the grand theme of the book, which is like the Greek conception in tragedy sought after in historical investigations. So he he says, the subtitle of the introduction, History and the Transcendence of the Tragic. So he's after spiritual truth in the Greek formula of tragedy. And if we, if we review that very briefly, <clears throat> like going back to your your uh, high school lesson on Sophocles, Oedipus Rex. There is a likable hero. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Got something in my throat. Um, there is a likable hero. Aristotle said you have to like the hero, otherwise you'll just cheer for his downfall. You won't care that he falls, that he suffers. The likable hero experiences a a. Uh, He's overreaching. He's transgressing boundaries. He has something that the Greeks refer to as hubris. All right. So this is an overweening pride, an arrogancy. He transgresses the sacred commands, but he also does it in a way that is understandable. Like you understand his circumstances. You don't hate him for doing this. You don't condemn him for doing this. In the case of Oedipus, he wants to know what has caused the plague in Thebes. Why are people dying? Right? Why is his city suffering? And it and he swears he will discover the answer to this. And we we know, you know, if we know anything about the plot, he is the cause of the suffering. He, he goes on his quest to discover the source of the suffering, and he discovers he is the source of it all. So he experiences a downfall. The hero experiences a downfall, and the word for that is nemesis. All right, so there is a, a minor Greek god that avenges transgression, and that god is called nemesis. So nemesis is the tragic downfall. The, the sin, the fatal action that bring, brings about the downfall is called hamartia, which is, is a word that we use in the, in the New Testament. Um, we, we find it in the Greek New Testament, and we translate that word as sin. It's not the only word that we use for sin, but it's one of them. Um, but in the Greek sense, it's, like a, it's an understandable mistake, not, not like malicious wickedness. Um, Williams says we're we're looking for these themes when we study history. Now, for me that is that is a profound sort of statement. And I think that that is one of the very best things that we can get out of historical study. 
a lot of folks say, oh, we study history so that we can recognize the mistakes made in the past. Well, yeah, we, we want to recognize where, where things went wrong, but without the tragic sensibility, if you identify what went wrong, you identify the sinners, as it were, without the tragic sensibility, you lose that transcendent aspect where you can actually learn something from it. You, you lose the ability to grasp a spiritual truth through the lesson. And that was something that the, the tragedians of ancient Greece were very sure not to do. They wanted their audience to still like the hero. Even after his tragic downfall, they, they wanted their audience to still care. Otherwise, the tragic effect does not work. You do not feel pity for the hero. And I, I feel strongly this is where American American study of history or popular understanding of history has gone wrong. We have grown to hate our own protagonists and heroes of our own story. And I, I think this has terrible effects. It's not really my point today, but um, Williams, he says that America, the, the history of modern American diplomacy, and, and he starts off with the Spanish-American War. He says that story is a tragic story in the classical sense. And that is a wonderful thing to say. Um, that, is a, that is truly insightful. Uh, he goes on to outline three elements of American diplomacy in modern times. So from 1898 forward, he says that American diplomacy is marked by uh, humanitarianism. So Americans strongly want to do good in the world. And that's something that that really sets us apart, that there's like a ministering quality to uh, American sentiment. Second, he says, Americans strongly believe in an idea of self-determination, that the peoples of the world need to discover their own ambitions, their own paths, um, making their own story. And and uh, obviously, Ameri Americans are, are strongly in favor of the independence of the nations of the world, like the political independence of them. And, and that is something that certainly animates our foreign policy. We are anti-monarchist. We are anti-old school imperialism. And, and we see that very early on in American diplomatic history um, with things like the Monroe Doctrine, obviously. Lastly, and he says th this is the big problem element um, in his, in his uh, three-legged stool, uh, Lastly, he says that American diplomacy has been defined by statesmen who insist that we, we believe in self-determination and we want to do good around the world, but these people need to do it in the American way. They need to be like Americans. They need to have American politics. They need to have American perspectives. And they certainly should have American dominated markets. And Williams says it's that it's that third element of the desire to promulgate an American way that contradicts the other two elements and makes our position ultimately tragic. So in in uh, summary, that would be the thesis of the book that uh, certainly since the Spanish-American War, though he does reach back further than that, um, but certainly since the Spanish-American War, the empire has been reaching around the world with uh, high-minded motives, uh, preaching its own, its own righteousness, uh, its own sense of the rightness of its cause, um, using the language of self-determination of nations, but insisting on American dominance, American dominance of markets, American dominance of global politics. Um, and it's that last point that causes us to lose our, our other two goals, really to contradict ourselves. And finally, uh, through overweening arrogance, we will experience a downfall in this matter.
Absolutely. And I, I think it he highlights a critical notion that I has particularly has aged both incredibly well, but it has also evolved in some way. And I think that that's something to keep on point here when we talk about the introduction, because he looks at empire in a way that I think is tr both in terms of that old 1910 study of imperialism, where it describes the expansion from markets and the expansion to resources, sort of the, what becomes the sort of tra uh, classical uh, socialist and Wallerstein-esque understanding of imperialism and providing systems to compete against one another and to assert power over it. But he writes, uh, unfortunately, there is an even more troublesome element involved in the economic aspect of American foreign policy. It is the firm conviction, even the dogmatic belief, that America's domestic well-being depends upon such sustained, ever-increasing overseas economic expansion. Here is a convergence of economic practice with intellectual analysis and emotional involvement that creates a very powerful and dangerous propensity to define the essentials of American welfare in terms of activities outside the United States. And you see this in the rhetoric of fighting them over there as so we don't fight them here or that if we can prop up successful democracies abroad, whether that be in the Koreas, the, you know, at the time Indochina, or even now more recently in 2023, the ongoing situation in Ukraine, that this can ensure that we can do well, despite however painful we may have it, it beats bearing the brunt in other ways as well. And uh, this becomes definitely the case when we talk about the sort of criticisms contemporary nowadays of foreign policy that there is no benefit to Americans at home anymore. It's other than just keeping a financial system that keeps us afloat and by a large extension, the rest of the world, as we saw in 2008, America caught the sniffles, but in a lot of the way, the rest of the world, at least in the West caught uh, a pretty bad flu, which had far standing implications more so than it did here in America, I think. And uh, I think that that's uh, a good thesis for us to look at is, is that there's a tragicness to it. We have not learned our lesson, at least when he wrote this book. And even after he died, we hadn't learned that lesson. He died in 1990. Kennan died at the age of 101 in 2005. Um, and yeah, both of them, well, their own careers are starkly different. One is a, an esteemed academic. The other one spent the first, you know, 30 years of his life as a foreign service officer that uh, they would come to these conclusions that the track that we're on is unsustainable and will kill us. We even have walking, talking examples of, of this thesis of Williams that we're, we're sending all these resources abroad while we are suffering at home. We have the example of the presidential candidate, Mike Pence, um, saying, I, I want to send more resources to Ukraine. The problems here in America are not my concern. He He hung his his presidential ambitions on that statement which is so extraordinary and and we've seen that kind of thing in uh, in many uh presidential debates and such i, re I remember um I, I think uh ron paul and dennis kucinich were both running for president at the same time when was that 2007 maybe does that sound right does to me, yeah. He ran in both 2000. Well, I know Ron Paul ran in 08 and in 2012, but yeah. Well, funny enough, I I think um, uh, the Alaskan uh, congressman Mike Mike Gravel. I don't know if anyone remembers this guy. He was he was a strange one. Um, he ran as Democratic candidate for president. I think in that same year as well, that same contest. So strangely enough, there were actually more voices on the Democratic side for pulling away from the imperial project in some radical way, uh, Dennis Kucinich and Mike Gravel, and, and then Ron Paul on the, on the Republican side saying, we need to get out of Iraq, we need to get out of Afghanistan, we, we can't tell other people how to live, um, we need to stop wasting blood and resources in these things that are not vital national defense interests. Um, we don't want to socially engineer the rest of the world. Um, I, I remember their, their voices were lonesome ones, but it was really good to hear them back in the day. Um, now those those are actually more mainstream positions. And we see Donald Trump and his allies still speaking that way, even if they aren't 
even if they didn't make meaningful steps in that direction, arguably, right? They'd incre Trump increased military funding dramatically and, and did not uh, disengage in Syria, for instance. Um, he, he escalated. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if we look at his first inaugural address, uh, or his only inaugural address uh, at this point, um, we, we see that he is denouncing this very thing, you know, saying we need to we need to rethink our foreign, foreign policy very dramatically. We can't send resources out of the country when, uh, you know, these are counterproductive actions. These these are things that cause blowback. Um, and Williams talks about that uh, a fair amount. E even uh, George Kennan brought that up in the Long Telegraph way back in the 40s. Uh, that we can't neglect our domestic concerns, uh, like the domestic well-being should always predominate. Well, yeah. Williams, go ahead. Uh, w Williams also mentions, well, wh why are Americans so interested in escapades abroad? Why why do they get invested in this uh, during the the so-called progressive era? Um, he says, well. Americans being this great industrial uh, Western country, they need raw materials and they need markets to sell finished industrial products, consumer goods and such. Every industrial power in the world needs those things. And coincidentally, the, the classic supply of that need is a colony a colony that produces natural resources and a colony that has a market for consumer goods, for those, those finished resources. And so there's trade going back and forth in a, in a flow of money from the, the seat of the empire to the colonies and back again. And this was the great plan of the architects of the global American empire to build a colonial system out of the markets of the world. And the United States ultimately is in the center. And this is the story of Williams's book. He outlines this in, in chapter by chapter, chronologically uh, approaching the present day. Of course, this was a book finished back in the 50s so it doesn't get up to the present day but he goes through world war one and world war ii in the course of this book and talks about how economic power in on the globe on the global stage gets concentrated in places like new york city and how the the institutions of government the organs of the federal government the the state department made use of Wall Street executives and bankers in order to create that system, to make, to make the uh, proxies of the American empire uh, satellites and, and colonies of the, the banking houses of New York City um, and, and the factories of the Rust Belt, right? Now, obviously, part of that system is now gone. Um, the United States is no longer the manufacturing powerhouse of the world, but the United States is still is still running the the show of globalism as it is. They're still moving the factories around the world. They're still financing the operation, and they're mo most importantly, perhaps, the rulers of Washington D.C. are attempting to dictate the actions of the rest of the world. So they are they are writing the coattails of this great success um, that Williams chronicles in this book. Um, Williams uh, is obviously coming at it from a leftist perspective and saying, oh, well, this is all inequality and such, and, and who, is, who is ultimately benefiting from this, you know, rich uh, Protestant Anglo-Saxons in the United States. Um, but e even so, I mean, I, I don't really care uh, that that he thinks that that some of these things are or should, should be phrased in certain ways. Um, I think that his his observations are correct. This is what went went on. This is the history of that time. 
And we are living in the results of that now. And we're actually watching it begin to fall apart. Um, I, I wanted to bring in something that just happened uh, just a couple of days ago. Our Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, made a speech at Johns Hopkins University. And he said a number of very interesting things. Um, Williams, just to reiterate, Williams says that the diplomatic powers in the United States, the State Department, okay, fo foggy bottom, that they believe their perspective on global affairs is the universal true perspective on global affairs, that there is no other legitimate perspective. And anyone that claims to have another perspective on global affairs is attempting to hide some sort of malicious intent. All right. Williams says that in this book. Anthony Blinken gave a speech at Johns Hopkins where he proclaimed we were witnessing the end of the post-Cold War order. He said Russia and China are rising um, I don't believe that he he referred to a multipolar order, but he he didn't say that word exactly. But I believe that is what he's referring to. I think it's I think it's by definition what he was referring to. There are other great powers, Russia and China in particular, who are in close cooperation, who claim to have a radically different perspective on global affairs than we do. He referred to them as revisionist powers now that was uh that was a huge revelation to me him him using the term revisionist for them what anthony blinken was saying is they have a different narrative of history than we do now that seems to me to be obviously true on the face of it and and why wouldn't they uh they're they're great ancient empires with their own heritage you know wh why wouldn't they see things differently it should be obvious that that even smaller countries would see things differently what well, why doesn't brazil have its own perspective of course the brazilian perspective is something uh, that they have a perspective that japan obviously there's some kind of japanese take on the history of the world um th this is something scandalous for a foggy bottom they do not abide this. Those are fighting words. It's like, yeah, you can talk about that among amongst yourself. Don't expect us to take that seriously. We will fight you. Um, he, he also says that uh, Russia and China are trying to make the world safe for autocracy, which is very interesting. He he says, and, and not to belabor the point, but this is this is really very, very interesting. And it reveals William's thesis. Um, I, I think this is a good meditation for us. Uh, Blinken said, they believe that big countries are entitled to spheres of influence, that power and proximity give them the prerogative to dictate their choices to others. And what is the alternative exactly? That the United States is the only country with a sphere of influence that encompasses the entire world? That the United States is the only country that has any prerogative to dictate choices to others? <laughs> that That is what he meant. That That is his position. And we see that in his actions, of course. And also, he said, they believe, uh, referring to Russia and China and other emerging powers that he does not name, he says, they believe human rights are subjective values that vary from one society to another, as opposed to American universal values. The Americans are the only people in the world that know how everyone ought to be living. That is the alternative, of course, which he does not state, but presumes in his rhetoric. And that is a really fascinating thing. We, we see in, in this, in this, landmark speech by the head of foreign policy williams's thesis was correct we perhaps we 
had more room to debate Williams at an earlier age. But I think, I think at this point in our history, as we see this order collapsing, we are glimpsing the man behind the curtain. We, we see Williams was substantially correct. There are three major factors that stick out to me that he discusses in this book that sort of highlight the turn of the century thinking that sort of sets this tragedy off on its own. And the, those three items are going to be the Spanish-American War, Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis of conquering the frontier, and uh, John Hayes' The Open Door Policy. Um, I've discussed The Open Door Policy with Christopher Sandbatch on this channel in a previous episode. I highly recommend that you watch that if you haven't after the show. But uh, I'm going to briefly surmise those three things um, with Williams's work here. So this is on uh, what gets called imperial anti-colonialism. Um, and this is where he writes, discussing uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis. He argues, although Turner's formulation of the argument of prosperity and representative government were tied casually to expansion, became the most generally known version. The central idea was put forward, but with minor variations by many other intellectuals in the same years. One such figure was Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan, who began his career as a naval strategist with anti-expansionist ideas. He first held that expansion would lead to a centralized government with huge armaments and would in turn promote wars, repression, and ultimately revolution. But his reading in the mercantilist thought of the 17th and 18th centuries and the economic difficulties and political unrest in the United States after 1888, which is after a major, major financial crash, mind you, um, combined uh, began to change his mind. Becoming a vigorous expansionist that the United States had to move outward to seek the welfare of the country. And though he clothed his arguments in the rhetoric of Christianity and the white man's burden, Mahan essentially derived his proposals from what he termed the importance of distant markets and the relation to them for our own immense powers of production. Um, very much in term of the uh, thought that this is for the expansion of manufacturers. Uh, still, another such expansionist include those like Brooks Adams, the brother of the more famous Henry Adams, close friend of political the uh, thinkers such as Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, and John Hay. Uh, John Hay, rather famously being behind what would be known are, as the open door policy. These are two letters that are written um, towards uh, China. Uh, these are the open door notes. Uh, the first one in September 6, 1899 circulated amongst the European powers saying that we're not going to carve up China like a melon like they were doing to Africa. And we're going to ensure that the um, China stays open to trade for all countries within their spheres of influence. Um, that way that no treaty ports that China's you know empire has with one government or the other is overthrown. Um, it was sort of accepted begrudgingly later came out and led to the Boxer Rebellion just a few short months later. But these that and alongside the Spanish-American War, which had expanded for dubious reasons, and in fact the introduction of the second revised edition of the Tragedy of American Diplomacy talks about how this, the, the Spanish-American you know, American War and its relationship to Cuba uh, still you know, lingered in the air come the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s. And these are sort of the things we have to kind of recognize that fundamentally change our position. We all have spheres of influence. We understand that. But we're also going to impose our way. There's this dispensationalist rhetoric of American foreign policy in the turn of the 20th century that indicates that we are the chosen ones. We are going to be doing such things. And things are going to be our way or the highway. And the expansion of markets to sell our surpluses means that the ultimate frontier is to go westward building off Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis that the idea that the new frontier will be in the East, we must secure good relations with Indochina. We must secure good relations with Japan. Most importantly, we have to do it with China because they will be one day a rising power. Um, and you sort of see even this formulation of thought is what sets off uh, the expansionist attitude of the United States at the turn of the 20th century and this, this is where Williams begins his, his act one of the tragedy. Indeed. Um, the, 
both the Spanish American war and the, uh, the writing about the open door policy reveal what we typically call American exceptionalism in foreign policy these days. Williams does not use that term and it, I, I need to do that, that special Google search that shows you the incidence of a phrase in literature over time um, to, to find out about American exceptionalism just when it, when it comes into common use. Um, these days, you, you scarcely find a political campaign in the United States where people are not proclaiming the depth of their belief in the exceptional character of the United States. Oh, oh I can we, show you that right a, now. We see appeal, appeals to that all the time. Oh, wow. Kicks off right after the 1980s. Wow. And there's like virtually nothing before then. No. Okay. So like the, the decline of the Soviet Union, the Reagan era. Um, and is it peaking now? Is it actually declining now? It appears so. It's, it's peak. Just barely. Around 2017 is its peak. Th this was something down. that my high school students were frequently very interested in. I had I had students that would come to me wanting to write their senior thesis on American exceptionalism or another another popular topic was the American dream, whatever that was supposed to be. But the, the trouble was just how do you define these things? That was where that was where they always uh, got tripped up. They they expected everyone to know what they were talking about beforehand. Um, but I I couldn't find old sources on it even back then. Um, I I looked around trying to help these students, but the idea of American exceptionalism, just what makes the American empire so special, so unique? Well, you, you see with some of these thinkers, they say, well, it's just self-evidently true that we are better than other, other nations of the world, that our government is superior to the other governments of the world. Um, and and of, of course, that, that may carry water with Americans that might share your sentiments, but it doesn't carry water with anyone else. That's that's just not a, uh, it, it's a fallacious argument. It's self-referential. Um, but this this is a common appeal. And we, we see this in in some of the characters that Williams is, is uh, going through. Um, the open door policy in particular, I'm, I'm looking at uh, chapter one. Um, John Hay, uh, who, who began his career as Lincoln's personal secretary. He had this very long career. In uh, 1899, um, he said that American entrepreneurs should enjoy perfect equality of treatment for their commerce and navigation within all of China. So this isn't one of the open door notes concerning China. But he says, including the spheres of influence held by foreign powers. So it doesn't matter that foreign powers have made deals with the the emperor, um, with with certain ports and such. The American businessmen, the American merchants, should have no no uh, set treatment uh, that excludes them from any area of China. And this is this is part of the meaning of the open door experience. And and of course you've you've covered this quite a bit elsewhere and and actually had a lot to teach me on on the subject but when i was when i was trying to get this through to my high school students i was always saying the open door policy means open your markets for american businessmen and this is one of the reasons why the open door policy did involve military intervention from time to time when countries especially uh countries in the caribbean and central america tried to limit trade or revoke concessions they had previously given to american merchants the marines would show up and make sure that door remained opened um, the other the other aspect of uh, the spanish-american war which is you know, a new era of American foreign policy. Now, now the United States is going to be a global power with colonies, but these were going to be different colonies. These are going to be colonies built on American ideals and American capital and American social planning. 
And of course, that, that doesn't make Puerto Rico or the Philippines states. Eventually, it makes Hawaii a state, which is really a, a very unusual story. Um, but they they take these these semi feudal colonial holdings and distant corners of the world, or or you know, an independent kingdom in the case of Hawaii, and they just annex them all, and they annex them in the name of denouncing Spanish imperialism. So the American empire is born out of a denunciation of imperialism, uh, which is itself paradoxical. And, and Williams does not let that go. Uh, Americans at the time were just willing to enjoy their expanding horizons. Um, they were riding on the back of, of business uh, successes of expanding markets, increased uh, increased wealth, um, increasing standards of living. Trade opened up, especially across the Pacific into China and Japan. That was a, a really big deal with the inclusion of Hawaii and the Philippines in the American portfolio. Um, now, now, not only could American steamers cross the whole Pacific, but the but the United States Navy now had a presence to to protect those trade routes. And that was that was a huge boon to American business. And it, and it led to a lot of expansion, uh, industrial expansion out west. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a square in San Francisco that commemorates the admiral who won the Battle of Manila Bay in the, in the early days of the Spanish-American War, securing the... Uh, securing the Philippines for the United States. And just now his name is slipping my memory. Do you remember who won the Battle of Manila Bay? Not off the top of my head, but I'm going to go look it up just right now. You're referring to, what, 1898? Uh, uh -huh. I think there it was... There is a square in... Oh, there we go. Dewey. Yeah, George, George Dewey. Dewey. Okay. So there's a, a square named after him, or, or there's a monument in his honor in this square in, in the middle of San Francisco. And of course, it, it built up a lot of the wealth and prosperity of modern San Francisco, that trade across the ocean. Um, but moving on, chapter three, uh, William's, uh, William's title is the imperialism of idealism. And he talks about the influence of American Protestantism and missionary uh, ministry on the expansion of the American empire. And that, that made me remember another great book that's focused on that subject, uh, that, that subject solely it's a book by Richard Gamble called The War for Righteousness. And it was published by ISI, actually. I don't know if anyone else published it. It seems to me to be a great book for a university press. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get a hold of now. Um, but this is all about how progressive Christianity advocated for imperial expansion and later on advocated for World War I. Um, on on the grounds that American Protestant uh, American Protestant enlightenment could be spread around the world uh, at the at the uh, head of American armies, and th and this is an idea that is that we can trace all the way back to the Civil War and to American literature, in in particular the Battle Hymn of the Republic is an excellent example of that sort of idea and how powerful that idea is. I, I don't think that this is an idea that's best understood intellectually or academically. I think it's much better understood emotionally. Anyone that's heard or sung the Battle Hymn of the Republic knows that there is power in that poetry. There is power in giving yourself over to those feelings. And what, what does it preach of? It preaches of the United States military being a force of good on earth. How many times have we heard that in 
our politics today, just in our retail politics. How many times have we heard a politician speak about how they believed in America or that they supported the troops, right? And and they're 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 thinking more emotionally, and the and these these aren't bad things in themselves. Again, we return to this idea of of tragedy that we can overstep good boundaries, we can overstep justice for excusable reasons. We we should be able to sympathize with with that transgression at at some level without losing the sight of the fact that it is a transgression. It's good to root for the home team. It's good to love your country. It's good to pray for the soldiers, to pray for the armed forces. We typically do that in our, our in our church services, after all. Um, but to to say, well, any any effort that they undertake must be ordained by God, must establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. That is the transgression. Right, that is the violation of the limit. Of, and of and what... on that point of idealism, I think it's a good point to to just take a selection here from Williams, where he writes, "The single most important insight into Woodrow Wilson's propensity and ability to fuse these two traditions, and he's referring to sort of this missionary diplomacy, um, lies in his Calvinistic Weltanschauung." Two of Calvin's central assumptions concerned the complementary nature of economics and morality and the responsibility of the trustee for combining them to produce the welfare of the community. He emphasized them very clearly and forcefully in his writings and tried to carry them out in actual practice. It is, of course, true that Wilson was not Calvin, although upon occasion the president's actions provoked some of his critics to remark that there seemed to be confusion in his mind on that issue. Nor was he a disciple in the rigid and narrow theological or clerical sense, but he did make sense out of a reality from the basic vantage point that was offered by Calvinism, and from his consolidation of economics and ideas stemmed from that consumption of the world. Granted this combination, contradictory as it may have been, of Calvinism and capitalism, the consideration most directly pertinent comprehending Wilson's handling of foreign policy is his commitment to the frontier thesis of Frederick Jackson Turner. The two enjoyed a very close and intellectual friendship while Turner was developing his thesis about American expansion and his propensity for democracy as an advanced student at John Hopkins University. Um, so there's John Hopkins yet again, sort of the sort of this intellectual hub for over a century now of um, this prosperity uh, foreign policy gospel. But I, I thought that that was sort of important because, you know, there are some more modern thinkers and essayists that will say that the hyper Calvinist thesis is just Curtis Yarvin's own idea, but it, it goes much back into sort of the blood and mindset of someone like former president Woodrow Wilson. Indeed. And in this, in this sense that destiny is involved, that the path has been determined beforehand, right? That, that is, well, well, of course, the idea of manifest destiny itself um, there is a, there is a religious dimension to it. Um, I I had a had a quote here just as a moment ago. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, Senator Albert Beveridge of Indiana I can probably get this one off the top of my head. Yeah, here it is. Um, Beveridge is is explaining the the purpose of the open door policy which he advocated and and he said american factories are making more than the american people can use american soil is producing more than they can consume fate has written our policy for us the trade of the world must and shall be ours okay so there's there's this idea where beverage elsewhere he says oh well we are we are disinterested humanitarians on a mission of mercy to the far reaches of the earth we are going to improve them we are going to build infrastructure for them we are going to build ports and roads uh, we are going to build modern educational institutions and hospitals which is true i mean they they actually did do things like that in the philippines in hawaii and puerto rico things that had not been there before in order to make them profitable colonies all right so 
the colonial proposition is not a zero sum game. And we we need to incorporate that in into our our uh, bank of prejudices. All right. We we've had we've had a lot of propaganda to the contrary on that. But it's not that colonial peoples don't get something out of the deal. It's not the best deal. Uh, they are they are deprived of of a number of things, right? The ability to make decisions for themselves, for one. Okay, there's this, a paternalist power that's that's looking over their interests in some respect and exploiting them to some degree. All right, but it's not a zero sum game. Um, but we we uh, we see another end of that. Um, going back to the the third chapter, the imperialism of idealism, we see Theodore Roosevelt talking about another aspect of this relationship. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt says, in in his mind, at any rate, it was America's duty toward the people living in barbarism to see that they are freed from their chains, and we can free them only by destroying barbarism itself. Okay, so there's not just the idea that, oh, we, we have something uh, worthy to do in the Philippines because we've conquered them. All right. And, and Theodore Roosevelt certainly did believe that. Um, but he's, he expands the horizon still further and says, so long as there is barbarism in the world, our job isn't done. We can seek opportunities to go elsewhere and do more, expand our markets. And and Albert Beveridge rejoins on that point elsewhere. I don't I don't have the quote right in front of me, but Beveridge is one of one of the uh, best orators on this subject in particular. Beveridge elsewhere says, "Yes, this is our duty. Uh, yes, this is this is strenuous. This is going to cost us. We must sacrifice." But we're going to be fabulously wealthy for it. <laughs> All right. So there's this this other side of it as well. And, and of course, you can understand what a Marxist would make of that. <laughs> they would make hay and they do make hay out of out of that sort of thing. But Beveridge really did say it. And that was what was driving the policy. Um, I, I wonder, have you ever heard of John Burgess? I have not no. Uh, he he was uh, one of one of these old school political science guys, uh, one of the one of the American originators of the academic discipline. Uh, up there with William A. Dunning and people like that, um, Burgess wrote a really fun volume back in the '30s. It's called the Foundations of Political Science. Um, just just to connect with. Theodore Roosevelt here, Theodore Roosevelt saying, well, we have this duty to civilize barbarian peoples. Uh, Burgess says in the Foundations of Political Science, there is no human right to the status of barbarism. The civilized states have a claim upon the uncivilized populations as well as a duty towards them. And that claim is that they shall become civilized. And if they cannot accomplish their own civilization, then they must submit to the powers that can do it for them. Now that that will knock you flat on your back, now, won't it? <laughs> um, this is obviously a political science of an imperial age, and you could say, "Oh well, he's just trying to justify, you know, the powers of his own day." Fair enough, as Jay Burden always says. Um, <laughs> not a, not a bad, not a bad observation. And maybe that explains it, but think of empire as a concept of history. And also think of the origin of the word barbarian itself as outsider speaker of an un, unintelligible language, right? Um, or the idea that, that, that there is a hierarchy of culture, right? Some people don't have the as much culture as you or something they don't know, understand things they don't know how things ought to be burgess's statement is not novel i think burgess's idea there that there is no no human right to the status of barbarism uh, by itself uh that is 
that's a very perceptive observation to explain action in history. Where there is disorder in another land, that compels order to come in from the outside. It there's there's a vacuum there. It is an attractive force for order from coming from the outside. Now here's here's the question. We have to differentiate between barbarians running around in our own cities today and barbarians on the other side of the world that don't necessarily do anything for us or against us, right? There is a confusion particular to empires as such. Every government in history has had a basic duty on two fronts. You could you could think of it as a two-edged sword. All right. The the ruler does not bear the sword in vain. Think of that as a two-edged sword. The first edge of the sword is to punish domestic criminals. All right, people that transgress the law at home. The other edge of that sword is to defend from those that assault us from abroad outsiders that come in all right and there is a legitimacy in the violence of both so the the head of state from time immemorial has been like a king with a sword and to this day we we see both of those things in action whenever the president goes anywhere who do you see with him you see domestic enforcers of the law. You see the Secret Service and the local police in large numbers, right? And you also see the military. He is the final head of both institutions. We've got the Attorney General, we've got the Secretary of Defense. They are, they are the two sides of that ancient image of the sword. Um, and the, the problem with empires is they can't differentiate between citizen and non-citizen anymore. They look around the world and they see potential subjects of the empire, uh, maybe future citizens, right? And that's one of the reasons why the barriers for trade and people come down. We see this with the open door policy right? Barriers for trade are taken down. And people that resist, like there's a revolutionary government in Honduras that says, we don't want all of our all of our capital flowing to New York City perpetually. We want to shut that stuff down. Okay, we are going to, we are going to violate our the agreements for loans in New York City that we, we took from banks in New York City, we aren't going to pay those back anymore. Uh, wh what happens to Honduras? Well, the Marines show up the next day and overthrow the government. And that's what did happen again and again. That happened in Haiti many times, in Cuba. Uh, it happened in, in a lot of those countries in particular. We, we uh, have a funny uh, colloquial term for those conflicts. We call them the banana wars, which is delightful. Um, I've, always, I've always enjoyed that term for all those conflicts, even though, even though it's all, all, all a travesty perhaps at the end of the day. Um, but those those barriers for trade are, are lowered, right, to allow money and goods to flow all around the world. So this is a globalist sort of system, right? And eventually, the industrial base itself gets up and flows around the world. And here in the United States, we lose the capacity to do all sorts of basic industrial labor. Like we have no textile industry anymore, which is just outrageous we've had that industry here since colonial days and we don't have it anymore we don't have a workforce that knows how to do it anymore even if we had the capital to rebuild it this is insane and it's because the barriers for movement of of goods and money and capital have have just been lowered so they can all go to china now right and the other thing obviously is movement of peoples mass migration of peoples why why do these things happen it's because we live in an empire it's because 
empires by definition do not know what people they are responsible for and they treat you know anyone who shows up as a potential client or a potential subject right um, and and that's part of the problem and and williams is is getting at that he gives us he gives us so many good primary sources about that long rant uh hope you don't mind oh no by all means those are always welcomed in that respect uh I, I think that that kind of brings us to a lovely conclusion for the chapter of imperialism of idealism um, that towards the outbreak uh, and the midst of World War One, we get to see Wilson's uh, idealism, you know, kind of act in the same way as so many aspects of our of our marketeers and merchants of today where he, he discusses, he says, and this is in 1915, he says, um, President Wilson had seen fit to take a more official duties and address the delegates. His purpose was to assure that he gave full and active support to a mutual campaign to the effect of, quote, the righteous conquest of foreign markets, end quote. Perhaps it was because some in his audience seemed startled by the candid statement of that policy. But in any event, Wilson went on to emphasize the point by remarking that such an objective was one of the things that we hold nearest to our heart. As in earlier periods, the question of whether or not American leaders acted from personal economic motives is besides the point. Indeed, such an approach raises false questions. Without any doubt, businessmen acted on economic calculus and its sophistry to ca camouflage the obvious as the complex. It is far more important that many of the businessmen and politicians were thinking about American foreign policy in terms of a functioning economic system that they saw as overseas economic expansion is the key element to the nation's security and welfare. And I, I think it's that he, he, he emphasizes or he italicizes the word system, um, that italics, of course, you can kind of see that when you look at uh, Wallerstein's um, world systems theory, uh, when it comes to understanding the impact of economic markets and imperialism. Uh, and so you can kind of see where these influences play out in their economic perspective. But uh, it does illustrate that the idealism of America, this expansionism, this, and even goes further. And you see this in, in his other book, Empire is a Way of Life, that the, the, the Federalists in themselves, and you saw this especially with someone like Alexander Hamilton, who was predominantly focused on manufacturers and manufacturing, that the only way that America was going to succeed as a nation and was going to find itself rightful among the old world empires and this sort of dispensationalist city on the hill is going to be by the expansion of markets and manufacturing um, agrarianism be damned in a lot of respects. Right. Well, in, in uh, connection to that, th this, um, this increase of access is, is not, against the interests of the people of the United States at this time. It's arguably very responsive to the demands of the electorate in the progressive era. We see a lot of people talking about that. Um, even even the, uh, the agrarians of the Midwest and the South are interested in further access to global markets to eliminate agricultural surpluses at the time. You have people like William Jennings Bryan, who are very enthusiastic about these things. Um, if, if we can get greater access to the markets of the world, then American farmers will be able to plant on all their acreage all the time and always get a good return for it. If we can, if we can disrupt the grain market in Japan, right? <laughs> we can export American surpluses to the ends of the earth and bring in more capital and and brian had had that to say about the policy as well i quote again from the same chapter imperialism of idealism uh brian who was woodrow wilson's lieutenant uh acting as secretary of state up to right before world war one uh he praised wilson he said wilson opened the doors of all the weaker countries to an invasion of american capital and American enterprise. And once again, this was done not just in the name of profit, though we can find plenty of these people saying, this is awesome, American productivity is rising, American quality of life is rising, 
capital is flowing in. Uh, we we are going to dominate the trade of the world. Beverage uh, famously says, uh, and these people are celebrated for it. They are rewarded for these for these actions. The building of the empire is a profitable enterprise. Now, now we're seeing the empire in its twilight right now. Um, we we you know the masses of Americans know this isn't working well for them now, but how did how did America become the the global leader that it is? How did the United States become the the so called or or the president so called leader of the free world? How did the Americans get the the high quality of life that they're so famous for? This is the way they did it in modern times. This is a, a major part of that. In in being so, it's part of our heritage, right? But there there is an, a level of exploitation here. Now, I I don't I don't call myself a man of the left at all. I I may give the wrong impression of wheeling out fellows like Williams here. Um, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not an industrialist or an imperialist. I'm not a Hamiltonian, um, in my, in my perspective here. So I have, I've got a, I've got a very different sort of perspective, uh, different idea of, of what I think a good life looks like. I don't, I don't want American civilization to be materialist, but I'm also, I'm, I, I also recognize it certainly, certainly is that now. But we have a lot in our past to draw on. This this does not define our future. We have been other things at other times. We can be better than how we are now. Okay, we have constructive things to imagine for ourselves. We have perhaps various futures uh, ahead of us. Um, but uh, another another element of the the building of the empire. What does this mean? Um, there is this very abstract character to this drive, and it is a a spiritual sort of idealism. Williams talks about um, one word that's used to describe this. Let me just flip back. There's uh, and I'm I'm I was just going to flip back real quick, but it. I'm not seeing. Oh, here it is. Uh, moral imperialism. This is uh, a word that's used to describe uh, the the expansion of American power around the world. And Woodrow Wilson uses uh, Woodrow Wilson describes this process, and he says that the United States is is going to use force if necessary to assert its predominance. Uh, in in things like trade disputes, okay, this is part of the open door policy. And Woodrow Wilson says this is justified because we are doing this to do justice and to assert the rights of mankind. Okay, so Woodrow Wilson uses again this expansive rhetoric once again. Uh, we we saw Theodore Roosevelt doing that uh, just a moment ago. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is saying wherever we see injustice in the world we have a right to get involved now what i want to assert here is that in that day that was a novel assumption and williams documents though though he alludes to uh earlier versions of this policy um in in pre-civil war america um, Williams does note that this is something that develops really rapidly in the progressive era. This develops very rapidly with especially the Wilson administration, where Wilson has this idea that the United States has a mission. Now, that that in itself is, is uh, commonplace ever since the Lincoln administration, at least, okay? Uh, Lincoln does an awful lot rhetorically to advance that notion that the United States has some abstract uh, moralizing or, or uh, enlightening mission in, on the global stage. Um, w Wilson really brings that into effect, right? But Wilson and, and also the likes of people like Elihu Root, who was uh, Theodore Roosevelt's Secretary of State, um, and, and may have served other presidents. Do you, do you recall if Root served other presidents. He had a very long career, didn't he? 
uh, not off the top of my head, but I can definitely look it up. But okay, um, one of the things that I think is kind of an interesting to sort of transition from this idealism to Wilson having to now deal with, and of course he's debilitated by a stroke towards the end of his uh, second term, but you see his administrators, you see sort of the bureaucratization, but that moral character. And again, at the time at the turn of the 20th century, these are novel concepts about how to respond to the rise of the injustice and what is declared sort of this public evil of, of Bolshevism. And I, I think that you, you'll see this throughout the rest of the book. Now we have to sort of reiterate to the audience that we're talking about this man because as the title of his book you know, writes, this is a tragedy. This is not a, a story of victory. This is a tragedy in the most Greek sense of the term. But he, in sort of the response to looking at uh, intervention and about what are we going to do with the Russian Revolution, how do we support um, the the aspects of not only just World War One, but what do we do about having the question of uh, Bolshevism and the rise of it? How do we take care of it at home? Well, it has to be taken care of abroad and it has to be taken care of at home. Um, so when it comes to the aspect of American democracy and how do we take care of the, the revolution, um, the idea was, is that if we can strengthen America at home, if we can bolster its security on its economic fronts abroad, but also more importantly, back home, we can support ourselves as the example and the alternative to Bolshevism and these waves of revolution that are happening in not only just uh, czarist Russia, but also across Eastern Europe. And of course, this would happen in the 1920s with its own Red Scare and bombings that are coinciding with waves of immigration. But he writes, uh, Williams writes, as defined by Wilson and other Americans, the economic aspect of democracy was based on the classical liberal assumption of a society composed of free, independent, enlightened individuals who acted in their own self-interests as producers and consumers. For the consumer, price was the criterion of self-interest. For the producer, it was profit or the wage contract that workers negotiated with the owner that sort of economic due process we don't have anymore. Since all these indications could be measured in money, the interplay of the various self-interests in the market place um, uh, in the marketplace produced an automatic and perpetual functioning system. Hence, the profit motive, if allowed to operate three, freely through the individual, produced the maximum benefit for the community as well as the welfare of the individual. Um, this is sort of your proto-line must go up uh, type of thinking. Um, you know, as long as the profits are good, as long as the prices are low, all else will be fine. But it's all based on the idea of free, independent, enlightened individuals, something that we most certainly don't have now. But Wilson argues that this sort of, um, you know, the growth of our foreign policy will lead to the growth of our nation. And in turn, this will allow us to have the better working alternative on a global scale to Bolshevism. Because at the time, Wilson and his successors uh, did not have the means or the political capital to justify an intervention uh, into Russia. Although despite using military aid, sanctions, they used this especially in Poland and in Hungary that were dealing with um, communist uprisings at the same time. Uh, they weren't involved in Finland. Finland won their civil war when it came to that. Um, but you, you begin to see the formation of what is common American foreign policy today, the utilization of foodstuffs as raw materials and foreign aid and utilizing it to prop up anti-Bolshevist governments. Um, and again, these sort of you see that K line more so in the left nowadays, the CIA and American intelligence agencies are these boogeymen, which Williams is quick to point out they're more anti-colonial than they are anything else. But uh, you, you see the logic and the political calculus play out that in the name of sort of uh, free markets, democracy, we're going to crush the enemy. Um, famously, Theodore Roosevelt in the progressive era would argue that democracy was the greatest way to ensure racial competition and survival. It's not in Williams's book, but you can find this in his own memoirs that uh, President Theodore Roosevelt found that democracy was the greatest way to ensure the white man's survival. And uh, certainly you don't see that today for obvious reasons, but I, I find that we're in a whole different world of thinking and we've watched it be warped 
um, throughout the 20th century. And even though he's writing this at the end of the 50s, Williams is already prophesizing that this will be used to destroy the country and by extension the empire and whatever satrapies the empire has, it will bring it down with it. And that that is going to be, that's going to be lamentable. It's yeah. going to be, you know, it's avoidable suffering. Um, but the part of the point of tragedy is we're supposed to identify the hubris when we experience the suffering. And that's part of, I, I think that's part of what Williams is trying to to give us with this text. And it's a, uh, it's a good, it's a good experience for us. Uh, we, we still have not experienced that. We, we still haven't seen the downfall, the tragic downfall, but I think we can see it better on the horizon. Uh, I think we can see that coming better than ever before. And I've been, I've been particularly interested in that subject uh, because I've been acquainted with this thesis for a long time. Uh, and I, I see, I see things breaking all over the place at this point. Once, once again, the, the speech by the secretary of state at Johns Hopkins, uh, Blinken's speech is an excellent example of that. There is, there is something big that has just happened. And perhaps one aspect of that is the American State Department has discovered that their go-to weapon against those that step outside of their dictates, their weapon of sanctions has failed. And their satrapies in Europe in particular are experiencing serious suffering as a result. That suffering is, is on its way. The deindustrialization of Germany, as an example, right? Serious declines in standards of living. That's coming on the empire's periphery. It's coming to, to Western Europe. And that's an incredible. That's sobering. Um, it hasn't made it to the United States yet. Um, we we are uh, in the, in the beginnings of a recession at this point. If if uh, nothing else, that I'm sure that has something to do with it. But um, we're we're still going to we still have a lot further to go, and and we see an official recognition of some of that by our foreign policy establishment. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to change their tactics. <laughs> and that's one of the most disappointing things about Blinken's speech. The tragic hero, in the course of his tragedy, recognizes where he went wrong. He says, at some point, I was wrong and I deserve what I have now. I deserve to suffer the way that I am. The tragic hero recognizes the hubris. The tragic hero recognizes the tragic mistake, the hamartia. That is necessary for the tragedy. Um, and we they have not gotten to that point yet. Um, but once again, going going back to this point, like we've we have told we Americans, we have told ourselves a false story about ourselves. That we are the only only uh government on the global stage that knows how things ought to be for instance okay that's that's the wrong story that is not so that is in conflict with reality all right let's look at at recent american experiences on the global stage all right the korean war it's a frozen conflict it did not conclude the vietnam war a defeat an intervention, a sacrifice, tens of thousands of American dead, hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese dead, uh, and the United States bet on the wrong horse. They have nothing good to show for it, right? More recent times, what is the legacy of Iraq? What is the legacy of Afghanistan? 20, 20 years, trillions of dollars, and the Taliban are back in charge. And we are we are watching the the travesty, the, the needless bloodshed of Ukraine playing out in front of our eyes today. 
where is the sense that we've made a mistake in our narrative? Have, are we experiencing a general sense that we've gone wrong in foreign policy? The establishment sure, certainly does not show any signs of recognition. Now, may, maybe the populace is appreciating this, this break with how things actually work in reality versus how we've been thinking about them. Perhaps there's a growing recognition of that in in the public, but there was a narrative shift into that way of thinking. And Williams is is showing us how that developed over time. And and just another example of that. Uh, once again, I go back to the chapter imperialism of idealism. Uh, Woodrow Wilson had had the the imagination to reference. Washington's farewell address. And if you know Washington's farewell address, for my money, the best thing Alexander Hamilton ever wrote. Definitely. I love it. I'm not a big Hamilton guy, but I love this. Uh, Washington's farewell address, he says, stay out of entangling alliances. We don't want to be involved with the wars of Europe. There's no reason for us to. We're an ocean away. Let's not get into debt. Uh, he, he says a number of, of really interesting things. He says, let's avoid political antagonism with our fellow countrymen. Let's avoid party politics. L lots of interesting things there. Um, but Wilson comments on this and he, he says, well, Washington um, seems to have meant, I want you to discipline yourselves and be good boys until you're big enough to stand the competition, until you're big enough to go abroad in the world. Okay, that's a really interesting revision of George Washington. Well, Washington didn't say, stay out of it forever. We're big enough, strong enough. We know enough now. We can go and play with the Europeans and, and you know, redraw all their, all their maps. You know, George Washington would not begrudge us that now. Well... I don't think so. I, I, I'm, I don't buy that at all, uh, Woodrow. I'm sorry. Um, he then, he says, uh, let's see, expansion is a natural and wholesome impulse. Um, he, he also, he is, uh, Woodrow Wilson is very interested in the Turner thesis, which we've mentioned Frederick D Jackson Turner several times, but everyone, everyone that knows their American history has to know what's meant by the Turner thesis. Frederick D Jackson Turner is one of the great American historians, one of the great historians of the American West. Uh, Turner said that American history changes its orientation when the frontier closes out West. So at the point where we are no longer substantially developing virgin territory here in the continental U.S., the Americans turn their focus abroad. So let, let's assume that Faustian spirit that Spingler talks about for Western man, always looking on the horizon, always moving, always conquering, right? Where is, where is that new thing? I'm going to go and civilize it, right? That's the American expansion across the frontier, the American settlement of the West, the push all the way to the Pacific, the sense of manifest destiny. Well, what happens when you get to the Pacific Ocean? Well, you keep going, right? You go establish trade in China. You go conquer Hawaii, like Stanford Dole did, right? What happens to those that stop? Well, here's here's my little thesis. Perhaps they become modern Californians and go insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, that's a joke. Okay, but uh, Woodrow Wilson referenced the Turner thesis that the Americans keep going, right? And they knew and each other says, personally. Yes, he knew that he knew Turner personally. They were both at Johns Hopkins together. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's alma mater, and Wilson says. Who shall say where it will end? So while Wilson is saying, oh, American expansionism, this is our duty, this is for our profit, we are doing this in the name of human rights, which 
by the way, Anthony Blinken said in his speech, that justifies all of American foreign policy. American, uh, the American leadership in what Blinken called universal human rights. And he said, and that's why we have to stand strong, because obviously the Russians don't believe in that. We can trace that back over 100 years. That has been the American narrative for 120 years. Now, what what really fascinates me here is Woodrow Wilson is also referencing a narrative shift. Is he not? In his speech, he says, George Washington set out a vision for our republic, and it was non-interventionist, so-called isolationist, which means trade with everyone, all right? But you don't force your way in. You don't project force to make money. You don't project force for idealism, for human rights, abstractions. You're at peace. George Washington's vision is classical international law, right? Despite what this imbecile Blinken has to say about law these days, the sanctimony of his statement that the United States is the only country in the world that truly understands what international law is. No, the United States has forfeited classical international law. And, and anyone that knows that, anyone that knows what, what the institution is, knows that that is the position of the United States. The United States makes aggressive war all over the place. The United States slaps sanctions and and disrupts uh, disrupts international treaty processes. The United States openly subverts governments and undermines them, overthrows them. The United States intervenes in elections around the world. One one of the most one of the most interesting examples of American proxies doing devious work just recently is the Minsk Accords for Ukraine, where American proxies, these so-called heads of state in Europe taking orders from Foggy Bottom, Angela Merkel and, and her, her minions, openly proclaiming that they never intended to follow those accords, that it was a cynical move so that they could secretly arm and train Ukraine and make war on Russia. That the plan from the beginning was a massive war in Ukraine. That is, that is so shocking. And it's so cynical. And we have these people on tape, by the way. We have Victoria Newland, you know, <laughs> doing you know, trading cattle. Uh, the politicians of Ukraine, moving them around, building a new government of Ukraine while while the protests are going on and the Maidan, um, incredible stuff. And this is this is stuff that we know we have them on tape, um, or or they go on TV and brag about it, like Merkel and the Minsk Accords. Uh, shocking stuff. The sanctimony of someone like Blinken saying that the United States is the only country in the world that cares about human rights and international law is just breathtaking and, and, and absurd for anyone that's paying attention. Of course, you aren't going to hear about this stuff on the nightly news, I suppose. But go, going back to Woodrow Wilson, um, Woodrow Wilson says, OK, we had an old narrative in American history is classical America, uh, classical international law. OK, don't go sticking your nose in other people's affairs. That's what George Washington said. That was old American foreign policy vision from the founders, whatever you want to call it. Woodrow Wilson says, oh, but we've come of age now. Now we have a new narrative. Narrative shift. Big narrative shift. Now, there's something redeeming about this. And this is this is what I, I want to go back to because I'm not I'm not here just to dunk on all these people. America has a different way to be. Americans have a different way of looking at things than this. Americans don't have to be interventionist. Americans don't have to run a global empire. Now, this is obviously, this is a big, big discussion. And, and it was actually why, why I 
I came on to these shows in the very beginning. Um, Academic Agent was having his big uh, controversy about whether the American empire is redeemable. Well, I, I have my own take on that. I don't think it is. I don't think it is redeemable. But that is not what makes Americans Americans. Americans can have a place, have an identity, have a history, and have heroes. And also, I think, be much healthier as a people or as many peoples outside of that narrative, beyond that narrative. We must transcend that narrative. And perhaps we're waiting for the denouement, right? We're waiting for the end of the tragic drama for that reality to emerge, for that new identity to emerge, those new identities, which I think is more likely um, and more desirable. Those things are going to come out of the ruins when this when this finally burns. And I'm not I'm not wanting I'm not wanting destruction. I'm not wanting the suffering, but the suffering is absolutely necessary. There's no way out of a tragedy without suffering. We need to look at it constructively, though, when when it hits and see it as the tragedy that it is. And that will redeem it for us. That will it will redeem us in, in some in some uh, some way. Well, since you brought up the sort of the war in Ukraine and the the policy towards Russia, which uh, dominates really the the subtext of both of the books that Williams wrote on the subject of diplomacy and foreign policy, I, I noticed in the chapter the legend of isolationism which is where i have most of my notes um for this text alongside um great his, his last chapter but yeah i mean it's, it's a fantastic the the if there's a book if there's one chapter of this text that you do need to read it's the legend of isolationism because it does sort of pick apart that idea that we pulled back we we, we didn't do anything and it always gets reflected by this desire to join the League of Nations or to implement uh, policy and these fanciful treaties that will limit armaments and somehow we're going to do okay and that we won't have war ever again. Fanciful, millenary, well, not even millenary, but really kiliastic notions of peace. But there was this section here where he was talking about Senator um, and probably one of the more uh, uh, prophetic senators I, I i think in this respect um senator uh bora and and he discusses um the the issue of two things one this expansionist revisionist notion of how do we utilize the monroe doctrine uh keep in mind that after the monroe doctrine was sort of written and drafted um it wouldn't be debated until James K. Polk is president, and he wants to use it to defend an American-led filibuster in the Yucatan Peninsula, primarily to defend white American settlers who had a very ethnic basis to the desire to intervene it. Um, uh, and so that was the first time it was debated. And in fact, Monroe was still alive until uh, he had died in the, the House floor. Um, so really the, the debate and having your own ideas be reinterpreted after you're gone happens in many such cases. But um, outside of that, he pushes and kills the desire, kills the joining the League of Nations. But he says this when it comes to the issue of um, our policy towards Russia. Bora warned that um, the American policy of a narrow vision, intolerant policy um, keep in mind, we did not formally recognize the Soviet Union until 1927. So we're, we're still in that weird decade of non-legal recognition of a state. Um, but he says, was helping to push Russia and Germany together. He said that was not at all desirable. And he urged the government to recognize the Soviets as a move to weaken that relationship. Um, and what, what has been sort of this concern since the end of the Cold War? Uh, you see this in the national security documents that came out and declassified in the Clinton administration. You saw this in the Wolfowitz Doctrine. You saw this um, from people like Max Boot. It was that after the Cold War ends, uh, you know, you have two large countries that have substantial domestic industry and want to appreciate a relationship with 
natural resources. Germany is still one of the more industrialized European nations. Um, it's about the size of Montana in terms of square mileage. Um, it has a little more than half of our current U.S. population in comparison. But most of their half of their market is still determined on industrialized exports. But they require energy. And where do you get that from? Well, where are you going to get your timber, your oil, your natural gas? You're going to get it from Russia. And what does America not want to have happen? Where does its liquid natural gas and its own finance and capital really want to be interested in? It wants to ensure that that relationship can't grow. And he, you know, Senator Bora is noticing this in the 1920s. And so 100 years later in 2023, what are we seeing? The same concern about pushing Russia and Germany together. So what does the United States do? It destroys pipelines. It utilizes sanctions. It deindustrializes and takes away the energy resources of Germany to do so. Um, whereas he was more concerned with a, you know, two post-war countries that have been dominated by uh, both the Treaty of Versailles and Revolution, and of course this is in the Weimar era. So you got to stop those two from coming together. Either revolution could take place. You don't want two powerful militarized countries to, you know, have that relationship. And a hundred years later, it's more about um, individuals with significant ethnic, uh, you know, animus to destroy one country and to prevent the other one from happening. And if you want me to, if you think that that sounds kooky or whatnot, you know, Max Boot wrote in 2003, what the heck is a neoconservative in the 2003, uh, in 2003 edition of the Wall Street Journal? He would explain that it's a movement primarily based on foreign policy, um, comprising almost entirely of a particular ethnic group with a primary focus on Israel and the Middle East. Um, and you can see that even today with individuals like Victoria Newland and Antony Blinken. Um, so there's that element that had taken these old sort of waspy classical liberal ideas and has now turned to them for ethnic animus towards there. And that's also the tragedy of uh, empires is that whatever did come out of it, uh, the elites have definitely shifted from that old wasp guard to something else. And even that guard is beginning to transition. That's why this war is so important that you sort of have this neoconservative uh, ethnic bent takeover on empire. And uh, that's where you get certain funny three letter acronyms for the USG and all that jazz. But that's a discussion for another time. But it does illustrate that throughout the interwar period of the 1920s, the key effort was how can we ensure that the, rev you know, the opposition to revolutionary zeal, primarily Bolshevism, well, the way that you do that is that you make your business go international. You make American capital go international. You take advantage of the Federal Reserve. You take advantage of the money supply so that the strategy of the open door policy can lead to peace on a global scale. And he writes this, American leaders concluded that the best way to reconcile the necessary expansion of the economic system with the necessity of peace by working out a general concert of policy among the United States, Great Britain, France, Germany, Japan, based on the acceptance of the open door policy by all such powers. Such a de facto entente in behalf of the communities of ideals, interests, and purposes was designed to operate on three levels. The nation would com comprise their compromise their differences and stand firm against the Soviet Union and other revolutionary movements. Thus aligned, they would direct and set limits on the development of colonial and uh, colonially mandated in non-industrialized areas. And finally, America's economic predominance would enable it to guide the operation while at the same time strengthening and extending its own open door empire. Um, and if there is sort of a, you know, founding sin, original sin, uh, ancestral sin, it may just be that open door policy. But this is at a time where, and, and this is why I think Williams pairs really well with the realists more so than anyone else. And I'll, I'll finish this tangent here with this, is, is that Williams recognizes the tragedy of this m sort of market-based expansion, not because he's denouncing capitalism in full, although there are plenty of conservative criticisms of capitalism. He sees it as tragedy because a people who desired growth and an expansion of its own frontier driven by its own fervor as a people that had some divine inclination that they were inspired to do so, that they were chosen to do so, uh, struck out and they tried to take on the world. And to a large extent, they did pretty well for a while. The problem is, and this is where John J. Mearsheimer comes in, you can only do this for so long.
and before eventually you will encounter conflict or you have to be offensive on war all the time. And so at the end of the Cold War, what gets what gets published? It's John J. Mearsheimer's The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. We are no longer in an age of bipolarity. We will most likely see the importance of ground military movements be more important. Um, the ability to have men on the ground and the artillery to back them up, that's kind of validated Mearsheimer's thesis. And that nations seek alliances and they seek market alliances to defend themselves from powers greater than their own. And that kind of pairs very well with this sort of American expansionist open door policy. And so he calls this a tragedy. Williams calls it a tragedy because it's prevented America from focusing on the self. Eventually, if you keep pursuing the open door policy, everyone can come in that open door and everyone can rob you blind walking out that same door. And Mearsheimer sees it as a tragedy because it leads to the likelihood that conflict is inevitable because great powers seek hegemony against what gets called revisionist states that want to change the status quo. And wars happen that way. And people die by the millions, if not hundreds of thousands or less. And we've seen this throughout the history of, of conflict, uh, Mearsheimer writes, and he's afraid that we might see it again in the future. And that's why he's so adamant that we don't escalate the situation in Russia. Mearsheimer's biggest concern since this war has broke off is that you don't piss off a nuclear power this way. But things can easily slide out of control. And so uh, that's sort of that, that long tangent there. But um, both of these characters, William Appleman Williams and John J. Mearsheimer, recognize tragedy as the central narrative thrust of our current contemporary foreign policy. And And Williams certainly is more on the realist side of these things. We, we've we talked about some of his ideological associations, but his writing is appreciative of a, a kind of tolerance of difference in perspective of its very nature. That is, that is part of its, that's part of its main thrust. And so I would say that, that Williams is much more a liberal than he is any any sort of political ideologue or extremist. Um, he he obviously has Marxist connections, but one of the things that he says in relation to the American narrowness of perspective in foreign policy, the idea the these uh, American statesmen had that the american way is the only way and they want to they want to be humanitarian with their with their partners around the world they want to help them out they believe in self determination but the only way to be self to determine one's destiny on the world stage is to follow american ideals to have american uh relations and and markets um and and to have this idea of human rights which we we can go all the way back to Theodore Roosevelt's uh, Secretary of State Elihu Root uh, writing about human rights as a basis of foreign policy. Um, but Williams says this this idea that Americans are open and tolerant while not recognizing that there are different narratives of world history. And that there are different perspectives based on heritage, based on, he doesn't mention this, but language, um, language itself is a is an organic perspective building uh, tool that that we we live inside of. Um, we m maybe we can reach outside of that if we can learn more than one of them, right? But most of us are living inside of a perspective just built with the language itself. Geography is is a way of perspective. You know, where are you in the world? You see the world differently that way. You know, Russia sees the stage of world history much differently, being that it is exposed on vast plains. Right? Russia feels insecure because it is vulnerable to attack, and Russia feels very differently than does Japan. Right, because Japan is an island or an island nation, an archipelago. It's much easier to defend. Right, they feel much more confident in themselves. 
in any way. Um, so many different uh, modes, the perspective uh, comes to us through. Um, but Williams says that the, the idea that you cannot appreciate that perspective can vary is infantile. And he attributes that to a lack of maturity. Um, he he also quotes our, our man Bora, uh, Senator Bora of Idaho, um, who had a reputation as an anti-imperialist. Now that, by the way, that's another very good and fertile uh, ground for research is American anti-imperialists. Uh, you, you have people like Mark Twain in, in that camp, for instance. Uh, but Bora, um, Williams notes, was it, Bora and other anti-empire spokesmen um, advanced an argument based on the proposition America neither could nor should undertake to make or keep the world safe for democracy. They maintained the idea was unrealistic because it neglected the different cultural traditions of most of the rest of the world. Now, ba back then, we could say, well, there are obviously members of the establishment and they're part of a, a dialectic that's going on. The American empire may, may be uh, at the controls and, and guiding things according to their own standards, but there are dissenting voices. And those are, are men with a big heritage to follow. They, they are people that are quoting uh, George Washington and John Adams uh, saying the United States should not go abroad seeking monsters to destroy. They have a heritage to go back to. And that informed their perspective then. Um, Williams suggests that Bora's perspective is obviously a mature and if if we could say worldly in a positive way, a cosmopolitan, you know, educated perspective in the in the sense that he knows that Japanese people have a different way of looking at things. And that's okay. It doesn't make them evil. And and that's another uh, very important point. Just searching in my in my book for another note that I made. I mean, yeah, the, the, that sort of particularism, America had it at one point in time. It had a leadership that up until the end of, I would say towards the end of the night, really, I think it's Coolidge, I think that maybe one of the last presidents that had a classical education in new Latin or Greek or potentially both. And uh, that doesn't, we don't have that anymore. We have uh, monolinguistic presidents but even Woodrow Wilson and his John Hopkins classical education knew Greek and knew Latin. And there was an understanding that cultures were different and that there were particularities of a different people. And nowadays that's gone in that respect. Um, there is sort of this universalization that all things have to be our way or the highway. Now it used to be for the nature of well, we're going to keep them over there and they're going to learn our way and we're going to bring them up. That sort of white man's burden, telescopic sympathy at a bleak house. But in that respect, they uh, that, that has gone away. But Senator William Borah was probably one of the most prominent anti-imperialists at, at the time. You also had Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, you know, famously say that uh, God made war so that Americans could learn geography one of my favorite uh, quotes by him of all time. <laughs> Absolutely. But there was, there, there was this, this cadre, this class that recognized that. Um, and they would lose in the interwar period. They would, they would lose out. It, it is certainly a provincial perspective. Uh, the, the, the isolated perspective the unworldly, uninformed perspective that, oh, obviously everyone must look at things the same. Uh, experience shows otherwise. Literature shows otherwise. If, if, we, if we did have classical education, ju just, just Greek literature by itself would show that there is a tremendous variety of perspectives in the history of ancient Greece. Um, but but Williams notes, I, I found the, the quote I was looking for. Williams notes, 
Americans became very prone to define rivals as unnatural men. They were thus beyond the pale and almost, if not wholly, beyond redemption. And this is uh, this is clearly the origin of our argumentum ad Hitlerum, right? That there there is a class of people that cannot be reasoned with, must be must be silenced, must be excluded, must be killed. Uh, they, they, if you if you listen to them, you'll only become confused and likely to be, you know, uh, seized by them as if by the zombie virus or something, uh, infected, uh, and and then damned yourself. And that is an immature position, right? Also, I and I would like to note, contrary to a, a Western tradition of liberalism. Now, by liberalism, I'm, I'm talking about what the Bill of Rights is talking about, all right? Uh, things like freedom of speech, uh, security of property, due process of law, e equality under the law, thing, things of that nature. Um, now, we, we know that a lot of these things in the Bill of Rights are now dead and gone, all right? So I'm kind of eulogizing this. This is something that Americans used to have. This is something Americans used to uh, proclaim as a kind of creed, all right? That liberalism it includes freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, free to, freedom to petition for redress of grievances. All right, freedom of religion as well. All right, people can coexist in American society with differences about the most important things, with differences on controversial matters. And the idea is that they could coexist. Now, that was back when. People were not afraid to say what a woman was. Okay, we we can uh, um, recognize that. All right, um, that was that was back when there was far more common ground with people taking exception to each other's opinions. They still had far more common ground than we typically do now. And that's one of the reasons why we don't have the Bill of Rights anymore. Right, you don't have freedom of speech anymore. You know what you say will deprive you of a living. So you don't say it anymore. All right. You know you're gonna get you're gonna get canceled. You don't have the freedom to assembly anymore. There are all sorts of things that you aren't allowed to disagree with. Uh, so that's gone. But that is also an American tradition. And I, I want to make the appeal there. All right. This idea that Williams is documenting that those that disagree with the united states deserve war from the united states which is by the way what antony blinken was saying in his speech just the other day um he hasn't moved past that he's still acting like an infant according to william appleman williams uh that is not part of the american tradition in it that's that's an innovation that's a narrative. Obviously, it's a narrative. It, it's extremely powerful. It's the establishment narrative. You disagree with it, they're going to call you names too. All right. Uh, you, you can get canceled. But the point is, that's not how it always was. Americans used to have more opinions than that. Americans used to be able to talk about it. We can see that even in Woodrow Wilson's day, he has a vocal establishment opposition, senators who are arguing against these things, and they aren't canceled. <laughs> now, doesn't that sound great? <laughs> They're obviously at a higher level than we are now. And I, I, I love them for it. They, they had more liberty to to live and and to do things in public life than we have now and i like that country i like these people i know i know you you may be thinking i'm i'm damning all these people to hell i'm not doing that that's not what i'm that's not what i'm trying to do i'm i'm trying to dissect ideas and look at implications right 
but these these people definitely had uh an amazing legacy they 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 had an, an incredible they had incredible institutions they changed the world they literally redrew the maps of the world and i uh i am very impressed by them um i'm i'm just a student of what they did well i, I think i might uh add this here and maybe we can um find a, an amicable way to conclude before this turns into an all-nighter but um you know again the the interwar period is filled with times where oh it looks like we retracted from europe but at the same time our our ambitions in central america only grew um and he talks about this in Empire is a Way of Life. Every chapter after chapter two of Empire is a Way of Life is a decade by decade from the late 1700s all the way until the 1980s, well, really until the end of 1970s, into the year 1980 of when we intervened somewhere. And the Central America is a huge part of this. Um, and so when President Calvin Coolidge is in office, he sends the Marines into Honduras in 1924 um, because of a phrase of the State Department saying a condition of anarchy seems likely to develop. And that same year, the administration formally advised Plutacaro uh, Calles, the newly elected Mexican president, that me recognition of his authority uh, was contingent upon continuing protection and respect for American lives and property. That blunt warning only served to strengthen groups in Mexico that wanted to push ahead, limiting foreign economic penetration and influence. Uh, so much of the 1920s and 30s of what America did in Central and South America was a big reason for the nationalization of Mexican oil resources. Um, however, uh, such laws were passed by the Mexican legislature to take into effect in 1927. One limited foreign concessions to 50 years that specify foreign corporations such as American oil firms must forego any appeal for protection to their own governments. A third and more general law, land law to break up large holdings impinged directly upon American agriculture and mining operations. Even before the laws went into effect, the tension and fear arising from a conflict between Washington and Mexico had prompted Calvin Coolidge to send the Marines in 1926 into Nicaragua. The president and others in the State Department were afraid that the Mexican Revolution would spread directly as well as in spirit throughout Central America. They were determined to prevent any challenge from the United States growing any stronger. The intervention in Nicaragua was to undertaken to put conservatives friendly to the United States in power. It is simply described as a military and diplomatic maneuver undertaken to achieve a political objective. Um, and it was expected to prevent a long range of economic losses and difficulties. However, um, the results were quite different, as they tend to be. For one thing, the Marines stayed in Nicaragua for six years. It uh, also created constant fears of a war with Mexico. The reaction is that possibility strengthened a movement among diverse groups that opposed American military influence and intervention in the area. Um to a point where even considerable public opinion in the United States raged against Calvich Coolidge and his policy, they probably were aided, at least to some extent, that the English and other countries like France and Germany referred to President Calvin Coolidge's actions as, quote, frankly imperialistic, to a point where even more conservative senators at the time, um, allowing uh, the United States and Mexico to settle things through arbitration, predominantly led by Senator William Bora and Senator Norris, alongside individuals who were prominent uh, anti-imperialists and critics of the project, such as Hiram Johnson, Joseph Robinson, and Democratic Representative um, Fiorello H. LaGuardia. And they provided the leadership to get a unanimous vote um, supporting the resolution to sort of just, you know, settle things without war with Mexico. Um, but because there were more conservative senators, you know, there was a, a big push to have less militancy in uh, South America, because every time that we do so, it seems that our, our policies with the United Fruit Company only pisses off those to the South even more. And this is why you see such a radical departure in policy with Pan-Americanism and the good neighbor policy and the foundation of the organization of American states by uh, FDR and President Truman in the 1940s. Um, but nevertheless, like these actions still shape our policy today when it comes to Mexico and Central America, it still shapes how we engage now for more, less materialistic reasons. We're no longer talking about factories or how to sell surplus goods or how do we, you know, sell things back to ourselves. It's how do we make things that aren't tangibly real um, 
you know, the digital has become the final frontier in that respect. How do we create fake crap, uh, a metaverse, a, you know, a, a currency that's crypto, but it's backed by the American Federal Reserve, etc. Um, these things have evolved in a way that are no longer materialistic. They're more intangible. They're non-fungible, as they like to say. Um, and they're and, more centralized than ever. Yeah, ever. Kind of shows those early predictions that Alfred Thayer Mahan had shows that expansionism does lead to a bureaucratized, centralized state that will always wage war. Um, but instead, he got older and had a different opinion. But his earlier predictions, I think, were definitely true. In the same way that Appleman Williams here says that Senator Bora Williams's predictions about imperialism were prophetic because it would come crashing down eventually. Although Bora never lived to see it. I think we may live to see it, but... Um, and we're only halfway through this book. We may have to do a part two just because it's there's so much to talk about. But well, I'm game uh, for that. <laughs> yes, um, by all means, so am I. You you, you were uh, you were just talking about escapades in in Central America, and I'm reminded I I would always bring in General Smedley Butler when I when I discuss that with my students who was involved with several of these things. He, he also went to China uh, during the Boxer Rebellion. So he traveled around the world. He won two medals of honor. Um, he was a uh, Marine Corps major general and then became a, a uh, stump speaker denouncing American intervention. Uh, the, the very interventions that he was part of um, in the Caribbean and, and Central America and such. He said that as leader of the Marines, he was sent in to knock over governments, to seize um, customs houses in, in the Caribbean, um, to make sure that New York banks got their loan payments before anything else was done. Uh, the, the financial... Uh, the financial imperialist aspect of it that that's another thing connected with the open door policy um the uh the state department employed uh upper management of major new york banks including the the house of morgan what is now chase manhattan bank um uh, they, they would send them to craft policy to make sure that american financing would reach to the ends of the earth and and that you know, the, the uh, loan market for sovereign countries around the world, that a portion of that would come back to New York City. Um, Smedley Butler said, this is a racket. He said, war is a racket. And by that, he meant a conspiracy of the elites. And he said, this is, this is wrong. This is immoral. And Butler, uh, again, spoke from an older tradition of statecraft. Butler spoke from a different American tradition, a different American narrative. And a, a more a, one more in line with, with uh, classic international law as well. He said, the only thing an American soldier should die for is defense of the homeland or defense of the constitution. And none of these things measure up to that. These are all wars for other reasons. To, to ensure that the investments of banks work out, for instance. Smedley Butler said that is not worth a drop of American blood. Now, ob obviously, that's not how things have worked. Um, not in this century or, or, or in the 20th century. Um, but we see that there there were protests we see that there are heroes to look back on people that were not okay with this people that stood up to it people that tried to to change the course of the the country's statecraft and they are and they are true heroes for it um and i and i really do like these people yeah but uh i i think I, I, uh this is, yeah, we, this is a good, we, good place to stop. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Well, uh, John Carter just said it's four ninety nine. He says the best uh, right wing stream currently. Keep up the good work. I think this is in part because we were live the same time when our friend Jay Burden was starting. Um, I'm going to check entropy real quick, but I think that might just be it for us today. Um, but while that is the case, Mr. Bagby, I have your links down in the description, but could you tell people what you do? Because uh, you do some wonderful narration work, and I think people should know more about it. Yes, indeed. Um, I have a YouTube channel. If you look up George Bagby on YouTube, you'll see that's where I read essays from books on my shelf, um, essays that I that I especially love, uh, lots of history, some literature, um, some is humor, um, some is poetry. Um, I have a buy me a coffee page uh, that's uh, linked off of my YouTube page. So if, uh, if, you're, if you feel inclined to support my work, uh, I, I uh, direct you there. Uh, most of the time I'm driving a taxi in New Orleans and I have a number of escapades um, to report from that. Uh, I have some adventures down there. It's a, a funny place to be. Um, I like New Orleans, but it, the city is falling apart. Um, if you would like to to follow my adventures in New Orleans, I have a Telegram page called Bagby's Corner, where uh, I share pictures of of beautiful things I see, uh, uh, decrepit things that I see, and, and opinions uh, that I have along the way. So if you'd like to follow me there, you may. Yeah, and I will add your buy me a coffee link in the description, but down below you can find his Telegram and his YouTube channel and the links down below. Um, DB88 says, the prosperity gospel foreign policy is a good one. We are blessed uh, good guys because we are richer and more successful than the totalitarians. Uh, many such cases, it seems that there is, I, I find there to be a strange sort of materialistic kiliasm with this foreign policy that we witness, um, you know, uh, and it's also kind of generated nowadays by that sort of Talmudic concept of, of tikkun olam, you know, repair the world. Uh, that's certainly the case. And then of course, Corbin sends $5 for a super sticker. So thank you so much for the ongoing support. And with that, Mr. Bagby, I have your links down below in the description. Do follow his channel. There's some really great essays that he's recorded, these pieces of Southern conservative thought that are lost to time that he records and his voice is of course, always excellent to listen to. You've all stayed here for two hours. Um, so with that, we will see you all uh, the next time I will be live later this Thursday with GU on the digital archipelago. And I will hopefully have an essay out on demographics as a, as a weapon of war. So stay tuned. Um, I hope you all take care and be sure to follow and support Mr. Bagby. Good night, gentlemen. <laughs>